I used to have to wear like dark hats and fake mustaches and glasses, you know, just to meet with friends who are clerking on the court because you talk to a reporter on penalty of um, never having a job in this town again, to quote Justice Scalia, it is a pretty leak proof building. So the leak itself uh, is stunning and I think has vast implications for the rule of law and the legitimacy of the court, which we can talk about. But I also think a lot of the talk about the leak has distracted from the merits, uh, from what is in fact uh, about to happen and how it's about to happen. I will also say that for folks who are really deeply surprised uh, that the court is about to find not just that Roe v. Wade was wrong, but egregiously wrong from uh, its writing and that every court that upheld it subsequently was wrong, um, probably hasn't been watching sort of the trajectory of both the kind of capture of the court uh, by one political party, the 2016 election, there was a seat that had been held open for eight months uh, that uh, one side was campaigning saying, you know, if Hillary Clinton wins uh, this election, not only will we keep that seat open, we'll keep it open for eight years. And another side that didn't campaign on that at all, even though there were not one, but three octogenarians on the court at the time uh, and a vacant seat. And so I think the asymmetry of focus around the court is one of the things uh, that shouldn't surprise us, but maybe surprises us. Um, and the last thing that I think I will say is that if you saw the way this term was unfolding uh, with SB8, that's the Texas so-called bounty law, uh, where you could receive a reward, anyone in the country could receive a reward uh, by suing somebody in uh, Texas, not just who had an abortion or helped somebody get an abortion, but who aided and abetted an abortion, which included the Uber driver or a counselor. Um, this is, the court had set this up to go exactly this way. The fact that a third of Americans um, by the polling I've seen were completely gobsmacked by the possibility that Roe could be overturned suggests to me that we have a sort of attention problem and a focus problem and um, a problem seeing the thing that was pretty much happening in real life in real time before us. The other thing I wanna say, and I wanna be super careful uh, to talk about this is that there is of course a religious valence here that we cannot avoid. And that although the court routinely talks about this as though it's a secular problem and a secular issue, laced through both Justice Alito's draft opinion, but certainly the briefing in this case, uh, are a lot of very fundamentally religious claims. And I would suggest not Jewish claims uh, about fetal personhood and when life begins and what a state's interests are that actually don't align with halachic claims about when life begins and fetal personhood and um, when uh, uh, abortion can be permitted. And I think the asymmetry that I tried to start with in terms of focus and attention is also really, really played out in the asymmetry of the religious discourse and organization around this. One of the things I think that surprises people is that a lot of religions, including um, uh, 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 Judaism, but certainly a lot of um, very conservative Christian religions were on the pro-abortion side in 1973 when Roe was decided. And the fact that this ground has been almost completely ceded um, to a handful of faith communities is really something I think we need to talk about. And I recognize it's an incredibly awkward and difficult conversation, but these are religious claims that come dressed up as secular claims and they don't get ch challenged nearly as often um, as I think they should. The other just sort of framing point I wanna make goes to this principle of empathy. Um, because I think the one thing that we can bring to this conversation is deep empathy for people who maybe don't live where we live and don't um, have the fallout from this decision that we are going to probably not see if we are in New York and Connecticut and California, but who are uh, the very, very, very people who will be most affected by a decision in Dobbs that looks to be 
substantially similar to the, the decision that is going to come down is that this is going to fall hardest, as all of us know, on people of color, on poor people, on the young people who don't have access to great services. And I want to really lift up because I think it's something that we didn't catch necessarily in the SB8 Texas uh, discussion that part of what happens when you construct a straight regime, a, a, a state regime that goes after people who help someone seeking an abortion, whether it is an Uber driver or a school counselor or a faith minister or a neighbor, if all of those people are on the hook for aiding and abetting an abortion, and we're gonna see that in Missouri because they've passed uh, a law that's similar to the Texas law, the effect will be to isolate the most vulnerable people, the people who need to be able to ask for help to get advice in very compressed amounts of time are the ones who are now most vulnerable because they cannot ask for help and the people who want to give them help cannot offer them help. And so I think that there's a way in which the story that we tell around Dobbs is Life in blue states will be basically the same. If you're in Tennessee or Mississippi or in Alabama, you're going to have to you know, get better at moving interstate. We're gonna to have to create funds to get you up to Connecticut. All that is true. But one of the lessons of SB8 in Texas is that it was causing backups in clinics in Connecticut. Uh, it affects everyone. And not only does it affect everyone, but it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, is that we are no longer, if we're really talking about fetal personhood, which pops up in the briefing here, then we are talking about birth control. We are talking about IVF. We are talking about surrogacy. This sweeps in a whole lot more than just um, abortion. And I think we have to have a very capacious view of who is gonna be affected here and how. And I think that to the extent that we think it just is gonna to happen to other people in other parts of the country, A, we're deceiving ourselves about how much it will inflect on all of us. But B, I think that the thing that has to happen in this conversation is a huge reserve of empathy and compassion for people who are having to make the hardest choices they would ever have to make now without the support of structures and systems and advisors that they might have otherwise had. The other piece of the empathy puzzle I wanna offer you is this. When you read in this opinion, all 98 pages and many, many footnotes and all the appendices, Justice Alito talking about liberty and the fact that there is no freedom or liberty, liberty interest here because there was no right to abortion in the constitution. There was no right to these ephemeral penumbras and emanations that they talk about. It is such a deep, deep misreading of the 14th amendment. And I'm embarrassed to say that I went to a very good law school and nobody taught me nearly enough about the floor speeches that were being given and the robust debate that was having about what liberty meant for purposes of freed slaves who are coming out of a system of chattel slavery who were not protected by the Bill of Rights. What the 14th Amendment was trying to do was give force to the idea of liberty, right? Not just freedom from the way we see it in the Bill of Rights, but what does it mean in a regime of chattel slavery to be free? And what it meant at heart was this, the right to marry the person you love, the right to bear the children you want to bear, the right to have your children be in your home and to raise them as you saw fit. None of that is ephemeral or squishy or feelings ball. That is exactly the set of rights that the drafters of the 14th Amendment were trying to create protections for. Because if you were a slave, you could not marry the person you loved. You could not live with the person you loved. You did not have the right to live with your children or oversee their upbringing. And so I think that there is a really sloppy tendency across the boards 
to be very, very dismissive of the set of rights that starts with the right to direct your children's education under the 14th Amendment, the right to uh, not be, have forced sterilization under the 14th Amendment, the right to marry somebody of a different race, that's Loving versus Virginia, the right to use birth control, that's Griswold versus Connecticut, and Roe and Lawrence, the, the Texas um, anti-sodomy cases, and finally Obergefell. And I think that we across the aisle have dismissed those rights as insignificant. Justice Alito basically says you can just make those up out of whole cloth. And I think we have to be really, really thoughtful in this conversation to ground those liberties and freedoms in the 14th Amendment that was born out of the abhorrence of chattel slavery. And to talk about that really openly and say, you cannot be free if you cannot protect those rights. Those are not secondary or tertiary rights. So the very last thing I wanna say before um, I take questions is that what happens next is really going to turn on if you're in a red state or a blue state. If you're in a blue state, uh, Connecticut has just pa passed what I think is a pretty bold model statute that is going to not just create havens uh, for people seeking abortions, but is also going to protect physicians and providers uh, from being hauled across state lines uh, to be sued. I think in red states, you are going to see and you're already seeing conversation like we are seeing out of Louisiana talking about maybe um, creating a, a fetal homicide rule that says that abortion is homicide. Uh, you're going to see a whole bunch of conversations like we're seeing in Mississippi about wh whether birth control is an abortifacient that causes an abortion that should also be regulated. So I think you're going to see a real push on the soft parts of this. Uh, and whether that includes um, Obergefell and marriage equality and LGBTQ rights um, is a hotly debated conversation in the legal academy, but I can't see why it won't include that. And so maybe the last thing I'll say before I take questions is that if you found yourself um, as this Dobbs leak unfurled and found yourself feeling as I started shocked but not surprised, I think it's really important to see what's coming this June from this court because there has never in my 22 years of covering the court been a term in which almost every single hot button social issue is on the docket. So if you think Dobbs knocked you flat, I fear based on oral arguments that I've been tracking this year that you ain't seen nothing yet there is a case that is poised to allow for open carry on the New York City subways of guns, it will massively expand uh, the protections of the Second Amendment protections under Heller, the gun case. There is a case that is seeking to do away with regulatory protections around the Clean Water Act, part of a larger attempt to do away with the um, uh, administrative state and the regulatory state. There are two huge religion cases that are on the docket, both of which I think will come down very vastly expanding religious liberty. And we've already seen even this week, you know, another, uh, another pickaxe taken to McCain-Feingold and campaign finance reform. So I think what I want to say is that for people like me, who said this court would do it slowly and incrementally, and carefully and in ways that almost seemed imperceptible, I take Dobbs to mean that we were wrong and that this court is gonna go big and they're gonna go big on a lot of issues. And that if you were shocked by this, and admittedly, I think all of us were somewhat shocked by this, you should be not at all surprised by what is to come. And we can talk in the Q&A about things that we can think about and things that can be done. But I do think fundamentally, and I understand there's a million trillion things to pay attention to, but paying attention to the court and the lower federal courts and folks who have lifetime appointments and almost complete immunity from consequences has to be a part of the things that we pay attention to going forward. So I thank you for your time. I'm sorry I was not nearly as cheerful as, um, 
I would have liked to be, but I really do feel as though this is catastrophic, both at a it sort of institutional court level and a rule of law level and a personal level, but also in terms of how we think about getting out of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Um, so uh, a couple of questions I'll just put out uh, now and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll share a couple of questions. You can respond and then uh, a couple more. So one uh, that came in was about what does it say about the separation of church and state? Um, and uh, the second one that just came in, do you, do you think that there uh, will be states that will outlaw IVF based on uh, this? And another one that came in about, um, I just lost my, uh, well, let's, let's stick with those for, for the moment. So, so I think the church state question is, is precisely the correct one. And, um, you know, I tried to say in my opening remarks that if you start as Justice Alito does with the presumption that the state of Mississippi could find that this was akin to murder or taking a life, that's not deeply rooted in, um, you know, secular doctrine. That's deeply rooted in religious doctrine. And he quotes actually from an amicus brief from two scholars, John Finnis and Robert George, who say, quote, an unborn child is a person within the original public meaning of the 14th Amendment and needs to be protected as a person, right? Which opens the door, not just for states to have these personhood laws, but a federal personhood law. That is a theological proposition. During oral argument, Justice Sotomayor tried really hard to press on that and say, isn't that simply a religious claim? And the answer was, no, there's lots of, of uh, uh, secular uh, folks who think that this is um, uh, perfectly plausible. And I think that one of the things, and this is what I was trying to say, is that if you are 20 weeks pregnant, 16 weeks pregnant, 12 weeks pregnant, and the health and mental health of the mother is truly at, at issue, then the states that do not have exceptions for the health or mental health of, health of the mother are in fact very much violating the religious liberty of that person. And so there is a huge, huge religious liberty claim here that hasn't been advanced, I think, in the sort of public discourse the way it should be. Uh, Professor Catherine Frankie at Columbia University has been talking about this and thinking about this and is doing really good and interesting scholarship. But I think that maybe what I'm saying is the asymmetry that I've described in sort of passion around this issue and enthusiasm around um, this issue is also a religious asymmetry because I think that faith communities have not done a terrific job of saying this reflects some, uh, but not all religious values. And in fact, is in direct contravention of my religious values. Um, I asked a, a law professor at UT Austin why there isn't a woman making this Jewish you know, religious liberty claim. And the answer was, there isn't really like a vigorous Jewish advocacy, you know, community movement at UT Austin right now. There needs to be, right? Like we need to really be a part of that conversation. I will say that NCJW, National for Council of Jewish Women, had a huge uh, march. And this is one of the things that I think they're trying to put meat on the bones, that there are religious claims that are as strong and as um, uh, deserving of solicitude uh, from non-represented uh, uh, faiths that, uh, don't, that are invisible in this opinion. On the um, IVF question, I can just tell you that if you really believe that you know, uh, uh, life begins at conception, then IVF is of course swept into this conversation. And I've had conversations in the last few days with folks who are in the midst of conversations with their lawyers, again, in red states about what to do about fertilized embryos. <laughs> um, I mean, these are non-trivial concerns. And I think maybe the shortest answer I can give to this is 
is X going to be legal or illegal in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Florida, isn't necessarily the dispositive question. The dispositive question is, is there going to be a prosecutor in one of those states who sees fit to charge uh, these things? And we, you know, this is not hypothetical. Just a few weeks ago, we saw a woman charged uh, in, with a miscarriage in Texas. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that. We saw in Oklahoma, a woman who is in jail uh, for uh, miscarrying with claims around um, the use and abuse of alcohol. So I think we have to be a little bit one notch more precise than will the state of X make X illegal and ask ourselves, will prosecutors feel emboldened to charge people with fetal endangerment. And I think this opinion and the sort of zeitgeist around, you know, personhood enables that. And I also think that we're already seeing, and we put up, I'll put it in the chat, but Slate posted an incredibly dispiriting piece. I didn't write it. Uh, an ER doctor in Alabama today writing about how already women who are miscarrying in Alabama are being turned away from ERs because it's impossible to discern whether that miscarriage is because of, because of a medication abortion or because of a sort of natural uh, 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 miscarriage. And I think that if you have physicians who are chilled because they're afraid of overzealous prosecutors, then the question of whether X or Y is illegal in Alabama is almost orthogonal to the concern that I have, which is that if you are emboldened and if you really feel that every single um, fertilized egg is a life, then that is the question. And again, this will fall hardest on uh, the pregnant people who don't have resources. Great, thank you, Dahlia. I mean, <laughs> it's very dispiriting, but uh, the truth. Um, so there's a train of questions around, um, I would say one is around, do you think the leak was deliberate? Um, and then the, the second set of, uh, there were a bunch of questions about expanding the court. Um, and what do you, th is that, do you think that's a, a viable next step? What do you think about it? And I would also say one of the things I've heard you say on some of the podcasts and the writing that you've been doing is around that Roberts has lost his court. Um, and so I'm curious to, to know like, what do you think the meaning of that is given that he has a long <laughs> tenure assumed ahead? And um, how does that relate to the question of more justices and also about at least what you just said earlier about the sense that you thought it would be, the presumption was that a Roberts court would be more slower moving and more moderate um, in big change and that's not been the case. So, so maybe I'll start with the leak. Um, and, and I, again, I, I, I open with how singular the leak is and I am, I don't, I don't know anything about the leak. If anybody wants to, you know, call me anonymously, if they know, um, I, we don't know much about the leak. I, I am not persuaded that this was, um, a cleaner or somebody who picked it out of a garbage can, um, because there's a, been a sequence of leaks following the leaks that really are very meticulous uh, reports of how um, the voting went, the straw poll voting after Dobbs. So the, the right after Dobbs was argued in December, they did a straw poll um, on the Friday and they sort of took a head count of how this was gonna go. The opinion was assigned to Justice Alito then. Whoever's been leaking has been very, very careful to say, uh, you know, the three liberals are writing dissents. The Chief Justice uh, is trying to float a sort of intermediate compromise proposal that would hold up the 15 week ban, essentially moving from a 24 week viability line to this 15 week, the state can regulate up to 15 weeks line without overturning Roe. John Roberts has one vote for that proposition and it is John Roberts. And so there's no, I think, energy for a, a compromise position. And the subsequent leak that we got at the end of last week to Politico said, that's not changing. 
Uh, there hasn't been um, even an intermediate draft circulated by John Roberts in order to pick off some people. So one of the questions about the leak is whose interests are best served by having this information be public? And there's basically two theories. One was, this was either, either a liberal justice or a liberal law clerk who wanted to shame and embarrass Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh. They're presumptively the people who might move over to a more moderate position. So you wanna shame them into signing off on some intermediate position that John Roberts floats. You don't write the words Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong and is overturned. You leave that for three years from now. That's one view of it. The other view is exactly the diametric opposite one, which is this was a conservative, either justice or law clerk, who was worried that Brett Kavanaugh or Amy Coney Barrett wasn't quite all in on the project of overturning Roe and Casey in one fell swoop, might be inclined to do something more moderate and wait uh, for another day. And this is a way of lashing them to the Alito opinion. So that's, those are the two kind of theories of the case. Um, there is a bad theory of the case that the Chief Justice leaked this in order to sort of get somebody on his team. I think just by temperament, he would be the last person who would leak this, particularly for sort of instrumental reasons. And I don't think that anybody who really thinks about how Justices Barrett and Kavanaugh operate believes that that would have picked them off, that a public shaming would pick them off. So I guess maybe the last thing I would say about the leak is I think we make a fundamental error when we think that the leak is for us. The leak is not for us. The leak is intramural infighting that is happening to try that for the justices to try to manipulate certain outcomes. And lest you think I'm overstating it, when the first Obamacare case uh, was decided and John Roberts was initially writing an opinion to um, strike down Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and then flipped, the Wall Street Journal had a substantially similar op-ed to the one that they had three weeks ago saying, boy, we sure hope that John Roberts isn't going wobbly and isn't gonna throw in with the liberals in order to, you know, bolster the prestige of the court, it almost exactly is the op-ed that the Wall Street Journal ran the week before this leak, where they said, boy, we, we don't know why we're guessing that Alito has the opinion, but we think that John Roberts might be trying to peel off some votes. So there's been, by some count, seven leaks at this point. It's not just the one. And those leaks are all being done for the justices to kind of bash on one another and try to sort of torture and intimidate one another, which leads me to my sort of coda to this, which is it is so bad for the court. I cannot tell you how bad it is for an institution that relies on confidential conversations and discussions and the ability to change your mind to have all this happening out on the plaza in front of the American people. That's the part I'm afraid about. On court expansion, I guess I would just say this. And this is again that asymmetry and enthusiasm gap that I have talked about all along. But when uh, candidate Joe Biden said, uh, we should really think about as Amy Coney Barrett was kind of getting mashed through onto the court when voting had already begun in the 2020 election. And uh, then candidate Biden said, we really should have a commission to study whether we should do structural court reform and then he kind of impaneled this incredible blue ribbon brain trust of the smartest people to think about this. Uh, and they took months and months and came out with the report. What the zeitgeist in response to that report was from a lot of the members of the panel, but also from the public was, don't intrude on the court's prerogatives to do it own, its own thing, right? This would all be an attack on judicial independence. And so to the extent that a year ago was when we should have been talking about this, and to the extent that a year ago is when there was, I think, some public enthusiasm to do not just court packing, the stuff that was on the table there was term limits, like not having <laughs> lifetime appointments for people who are 40, 
and uh, jurisdiction stripping and all sorts of transparency and ethics reform, nothing, nothing that was floated by that commission was taken seriously, uh, both by the public or by the court. And so this is another one of those almost too little too late, where there was a mechanism to, you know, create real public engagement and enthusiasm about doing something. And I think that there was just a sense that the court wasn't all that bad, or that the court would modulate its behavior because the public approval ratings were in the 30s this term. And I think that that was, I again, was one of the people who thought the court would modulate its behavior because its public approval rating was in the 30s this term. That just hasn't happened. And I guess what I would say is there are a couple of really good court reform bills. And for folks who um, want to support that, I think this isn't just court packing, which is important, but it's also disclosure rules. If your spouse was involved in a case about January 6th, maybe you shouldn't be sitting on that case. There's no rules governing the court. Some of those things have really, really smart, good, particularly in New York, Congress people who are pushing them. And so I think we could really dig down and find the enthusiasm for that. The polling I'm seeing now post Dobbs leak shows that there is real interest in some of those court reforms, especially around ethics and transparency. But I also think this is the kind of thing that we were on screen save <laughs> for a lot of years when we should have been engaging on this conversation and waiting until, with all due respect, Clarence Thomas you know, has his actual partner involved in January 6th text with Mark Meadows is way, way, way too late to be starting to think about starting to have this conversation. So I'm all for people really, really engaging with this. I also just think like this was a problem five years ago. Great, thanks, Dahlia. Um, there's uh, been some conversation, uh, at least in the chat, as well as some who emailed me directly about um, that this is not really the the halakhic position really takes into the well-being, obviously, of the mother and her mental health and her physical health, et cetera. Um, but there, even in the Jewish community, there's been some question about, is that far enough? Shouldn't it be around kind of the, the a woman's right to choose her own, what happens to her body? And, um, and so from a religious perspective, and I'm not asking you to weigh in on the halakhic um, kind of um, basis for the liber for the liber the reason to have liberty for women um, to get an abortion in the Jewish tradition that's grounded in the tradition, but kind of what does it mean to have law that allows for women actually to choose what happens to their body, and um, so and someone put in the in a question you know it as it goes forward in terms of this case there's the right of the supposedly the right of the fetus, there's the right of the woman, and perhaps there's the right of the man, or maybe that's just to decide the case. Um, so how do you like think about the notion, and, and you also said prior to this beginning that you've been disappointed in some way that the engagement seems to be very heavy women, that it seems to be gendered, at least what you're seeing in terms of the outrage, and what does it mean to live in a space that doesn't even consider that a basic right? Um, and, and how does that also relate to the fact that even countries that are very conservative, also from a religious perspective, are actually making progress on this or becoming more progressive, like in South America or in Ireland? Um, so that's a, a, a lot all at once, but just some of your thoughts about those questions. I, I mean, it's so interesting. There's so many takes to this and I you know I'm always thinking I sort of have like Justice Ginsburg headphones in my head uh, in these conversations because this is an issue on which she felt so deeply when she was asked what she advised to put in South Africa's constitution you know when they were sort of like figuring this out a new and what didn't exist in the United States Constitution. And the thing she always talked about was dignitary rights. And she said sort of the right of dignity is a thing that is nowhere enshrined in the Constitution. And yet 
it is, and maybe this a little bit goes back to what I was saying about, you know, former slaves, that there are, we can all agree, right? This is Justice Kennedy's opinion in the LGBTQ cases about dignity as an absolutely essential part of freedom and liberty. And yet it's nowhere, right? It's this vaporous uh, uh, right that gets seen as being grafted on to, you know, Lawrence and Obergefell in the LGBTQ cases. And so part of me wants to start with dignity. And one of the things that to me as, you know, somebody who thinks about this through the lens of gender is how dismissive Justice Alito is of the phenomenal briefing that they had in this case in Dobbs that they didn't have in Roe and Casey about now we know the things that they they were spitballing in Roe and they were spitballing in Casey about how this would actually affect the lived experience of people who are forced to carry to term. And there's a little language in Casey in 1992 which reaffirms uh, 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 Roe where they're starting to say like, oh, wow, it would be really hard for women to be equal participants in the economy, right, in the workplace, if they couldn't determine uh, how and when they had children. There's a really fashionable thing that says, oh, if I had written Roe, like, oh, Justice Blackman, silly man, you know, enshrined, by the way, mentions doctors many, many more times than he mentions women because he was really thinking about the rights of the like white guy doctor when he wrote it. But it, he was a creature of his time and that was the liberty interest he was thinking about. But I think that one of the things that really makes me sad is if you read the briefing in Dobbs, there is a Nobel Prize winning economist's brief that shows what women's lives are like if they cannot you know, control their reproductive lives. There is finally really good data on the economic impacts of being pregnant as a teen and unable to go to school. There is really good data on being in a state that has maternal and child health outcomes like Mississippi that are so catastrophically bad that they should be figured into this and they're not. And I think one of the things that's painful in reading this brief, and obviously at this point you figured out I don't love this um, draft opinion, is how invisible the right of women to have that dignitary interest is. And kind of the insult to the injury of, of quoting people like Sir Matthew Hale, you know, who are like British, you know, jurists who believe that witch burning was a thing, you know, and who believe that men couldn't rape their own wives because their wife was their property. And so I think this is my sort of huge wind up to saying that I think my halachic worldview is very informed by the idea that we are all made B'Tselem Elohim and that we are all you know, worthy of the sort of dignitary, autonomous um, agency that you know, we, we, we are promised. And so I, I know that's an ephemeral answer. It's the best I can give in terms of not just, you know, there's good, good halachic thought on, you know, babies are, you know, liquid until they're not liquid and they're part of the mother right until, but, and how generous concerns about the mother's mental health are. All of that wildly predates Matt, Sir Matthew Hale, <laughs> who was like all in for the witch burning. And so I guess I just think there's a very straight line between traditional halachic respect for women and mothers and babies and fathers and the complexity of this and the lived lives that gets completely sidelined in favor of really kind of crackpot ideas about women as essentially like under these laws of couverture, you know, their husband's property. Is that responsive? I don't even know if that was responsive, but it's sure. dignity. Dignity is a big, big marker for me. Great. Great. Uh, so this is going to be the last set of questions. I just want to acknowledge there have been tons of questions that have been sent to me. Some also are in the chat. Some are very specific. We can't cover them all tonight. And um, there's lots 
that Dahlia has been putting out to read and many others too. Um, so uh, I just wanna apologize for not being able to entertain all the questions. Um, so uh, one, um, so I'm gonna pose two questions. The, the first is really, what does this mean for you around democracy? Um, particularly given kind of the vigilante justice that, you know, SB8 and in Texas and, and some of the possible outcomes for this. And also this came up as well in the, some people asked about, do you think that other, we're going backwards in terms of the stripping away of civil rights in terms of interracial marriage or, or um, same sex marriage, some of the, the kind of next steps that could come from the court. And so what does that all mean for democracy from your perspective? And then the, the second question is, what do we do? Um, what is, and I'll just say that BJ has been signed on to 73 Forward from the National Council of Jewish Women um, and will be continuing to be engaged on that level as a progressive religious community. Um, but from where, where is the, the movement for how do we have impact um, instead of just screaming our heads off, you know, like which could drive a, a person insane? And like, where is really our power here, given that we don't have a lot of power when it comes to the Supreme Court itself? Um, what should we do? So I want to answer the democracy question first, because you asked it first, and because I think it's really the answer to how is it possible that last week in the Senate, they brought WIPA, right, the Women's Health Protection Act to the floor and it, you know, didn't get enough votes in any way it wouldn't have survived the filibuster. And the answer to that is the depressing answer, which is 70 some percent, depending on whose poll, this is the ABC polling numbers, but in the ballpark of Americans don't want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Around the same number of Americans don't really wanna see people walking around the New York City subways open carrying guns, right? So how did we get to a situation where Justice Alito is writing in his opinion in Dobbs, if you don't like this, just take it to the political branches, right? Go to the political branches and this can be fixed. And that's a slightly fatuous answer from the justice who just last year in Brnovich gutted section two of the Voting Rights Act, right? This is the court that has upheld gerrymandering, political partisan gerrymandering. They have upheld Citizens United pouring dark money into you know, the election system. They gutted section five of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County. So like time and time and time again, this is a court that blesses democracy constricting measures and then says, take it to your legislature, right? So I think we just need to start from the proposition. And on this, I am very, very serious. The court is built to be a minoritarian institution, right? We wanted one institution that was totally insulated from the polls and majority rules and you know legislatures who were captive to public preferences. That's how we got Brown v. Board, right? That's how Plessy versus Ferguson gets overruled. And so it's important to acknowledge that we have a branch of government that doesn't only triangulate against the polls. That said, that branch of government at this moment has five of the six Republican appointees appointed by a president who lost the popular election, but because of the electoral college was seated and then approved by a Senate that is so malapportioned that you all in New York have the same two number of senators that people have in South Dakota, right? So we have a minoritarian president a minoritarian Senate blessing a minoritarian Supreme Court that then turns around and makes decisions about who gets to vote and who in case after case signs off on vote purging and says there's such a thing as, you know, vote fraud. There's no such thing. And that says that, you know, we can go ahead and allow for partisan political gerrymanders. So the court is actually working to make it possible that 70% of the country can hate an outcome and still cannot vote it out. And that's really different 
from Brown v. Board. That's really different from a minoritarian institution protecting minoritarian rights. And the, the best way to think about this for folks who are lawyers on the call is, you know, John Hart Ely, the famous sort of uh, uh, judicial thinker, talked about how the court's minoritarian interest was in protecting democracy. This court is like the flip of Ely. This is a minoritarian interest protecting dismantling democracy. And so the answer is the same Senate that couldn't pass WIPA last week, which would have codified Roe v. Wade into law, also couldn't pass HB1, which was the voting rights. You know, it couldn't even get it in, up for debate, right? So I think we just need to understand that we are working with democratic systems that are fundamentally broken. I would commend to folks Eric Holder's new book just out last week where he talks about all this. But I think that the linchpin to this very wonky answer is we have to fix democracy. We have to restore one person, one vote. We have to uh, you know, get rid of you know, measures that are being passed around the country to suppress the vote. And we need to think really carefully about how intrinsically voting rights are connected to getting outcomes that uh, are meaningful represent what the population wants. And so that's my very dorky answer that if we aren't working to get voting rights protections passed, then all of this other stuff that's really interesting and important doesn't happen. And that the court is putting a very heavy thumb on the scale of making sure that that doesn't happen. So that's my sort of de depressing democracy answer. On the sort of I think, slightly less depressing, what can folks do? What folks can do is really, really, really get people to vote and to understand that all of the stuff that we have ignored, including court reform, including state houses, including boring state races for your state lieutenant governor and your you know attorney general, all of that stuff has to be top of mind now. And it's just not good enough to show up in presidential election years. And it's not good enough to say, like, I only care about who's at the top of the ticket. Because if we have learned anything this year, it's that like state attorneys general and state elections officials, who by the way, nonpartisan state elections officials are fleeing the field uh, because they're terrified, school boards, all of those elections matter. And I think we just have to put skin in the game. And I think this is where I'm going to try to end on a slightly hopeful note. Sherwin Eiffel said on our podcast, right at the new year, that the superpower we have is empathy. <laughs> and that the thing that we forget, and she described, you know, being sort of, you know, an African American kid reading Anne Frank didn't she was like, I wasn't German, I'm not German, <laughs> you know, I don't know, I didn't do that. But understanding what it is to be a human being and to hold up, you know, the values of righteousness and justice. And the reason people showed up to vote in COVID in Georgia for, you know, two senators who were not favored to win is because Stacey Abrams like absolutely said to them, vote the way Black people have been voting in this country since the minute they got the right to vote, which is you're going to stand in a line, people are going to intimidate you, they're going to ask to see your document, vote that way. And people did, and people do. And so I think this is why I sort of tried to talk about empathy and imagination. They sound corny, but we all of us, all of us, all of us have to just say, like, it's just not enough to buy the RBG mug. Like, it's just not enough. We have to be all in for democracy repair, for court repair, for thinking about you know, how states are trying to do gerrymandering reform, state supreme, all of it, all of it, all of it. And it's so exhausting and I am as tired as you are, but if we think about it in sort of isolated silos, we can't get there. We have to see it as all connected. And then we have to see that we are all connected to being part of the fix. So I know that's like super, super, super corny, but that's where I land up. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Uh, it's, it's good to have an end up in a little bit of a higher note. Uh, I just wanna 
say a couple of things and I'm going to hand it to Roly to, to end. Um, someone asked if BJ was going to have some study of the halakha when it comes to abortion. Um, I spoke about this in the fall. It's on our uh, webpage. I have a Devar Torah about it from October. And um, there are also the National Council of Jewish Women has a resource page that includes a lot of the halakhic sources on this. Doesn't mean we won't do it again, uh, but just know that the resources are available and the, the rally that took place yesterday morning, also many of the speakers spoke to those issues. So that's one thing. And the second thing is we are in an ongoing um, campaign with Reclaim the Vote. Um, uh, and so actually this just this afternoon, we were doing calling, et cetera. So that work is continuing with uh, BJ and other communities. And so uh, that's just one other way we're trying to be engaged on these questions of some of the things that Dahlia said, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Roli to thank and conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you so much, Dahlia, on behalf of uh, all 120 something of us who were really uh, uh, moved by your, uh, by your presentation. Uh, and I say moved because a uh, tremendous amount of compassion and empathy that you brought into it, besides your insights, your wisdom, your knowledge, uh, the presentation of how vast the implications of this issue are. Uh, we're entering now Lag Baomer, so the bad news should stop. And you ended right on the right note that we should get ourselves together and up and and defend the voting rights and defend all the things we need to defend. So we're really grateful for all you've given us and uh, we will continue to follow you on uh, Slate, podcast, television and so on. Um, and we hope you'll be blessed in everything that you do. We're very, very grateful. Thank you so much and good night to everyone. Thank you for joining. and. Uh, uh, continue to be uh, plugged into everything that we do, we have to mobilize and we will mobilize, as Felicia just said, we claim the vote in many other ways and uh, we can't now rest. We have to get ourselves to, to work and so let's step up and do the work. Laila Tov, happy Lagba Omer to everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.